Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to another session in our Women Lead online forums brought to you by the Connected Women of Influence. I'm Patty Vargas, and I'm your host today. And today we are in the ladies' room. You know, it's that place where women talk about the things we might not just say anywhere, things that we can only say to one another because, well, because we've all had shared experiences. And this is our opportunity to talk about it, maybe vent some frustrations, give advice to one another, have some group therapy, and then come away with some new ideas or some validation. We like to say that in the ladies' room, we go there. So our session tonight is about an hour. If you've joined with video, you'll be able to see all of our panelists and questions and comments are always welcome. And if you have something you'd like to contribute anonymously, just put it in the chat to me and then I'd be happy to share it for you. So our topic tonight in the ladies room is guess what? You're not superwoman and taking care of you while you take care of business. And I'm really excited to introduce our special guests today. So let me tell you a little bit about each of them. First, we have Linda Turgeson, who is the founder of LTLTE, easiest acronyms ever to remember, because it stands for Learn to Love to Exercise. And Linda is an entrepreneur who is following her passion for health and fitness. Originally from Norway, Linda is a dedicated and persistent individual who thrives on change and likes to push her own limits. And Linda says, this is really good for me, middle age doesn't have to equate health problems. You don't have to live on medication, rely on a bunch of supplements, feel tired and depressed. It's your choice to improve your health, and it's never too late to get started. So welcome, Linda. Wave to everybody. Thank you. Second, we have Ana Nieto, who is the owner at Velar Transformational Health Mentorship. Anna is a trained nurse, personal trainer, nutrition specialist, mindful guiding coach, and the creator of the Mindful Online Workouts. She's worked in the health and wellness field for 18 years. She's also managed and started farmers markets, both in New York and San Diego, as part of her mission to create sustainable communities. She believes in the healing power of movement and performing arts, and that's what led her to performing, producing, creating, and directing immersive theater shows in both New York and the West Coast. Anna's new business model incorporates more than personal training, and it's geared toward helping you transform not only how you look and feel, but transform how you relate to life itself. So Anna, welcome. Give everybody a high five. Hi. Eva Venari says, it doesn't matter where you are, it matters where you want to go. And Eva knows what it's like to be a successful, high-performing executive who's being pushed to the limit every day. Coffee runs in the veins throughout the day and glasses of wine by night to stop the rush and get a good night's sleep, just to get up and do it all over again. And if this sounds like you, you might be on the brink of exhaustion and a little anxious thinking, what's going to happen when the coffee and the wine stop working? So I can't wait to hear the answer to that question. So Eva, give us a, a wave. I'll give you a vocal wave. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, uh, Dr. Rachel Hamill is a holistic cranial chiropractor who, unlike many chiropractors, specializes in craniopathy and optimal body functioning. Her focus is to look at the entire picture of your health and determine neurologically how your pattern is affecting your growth, your development, and performance. This can help you feel so much more energetic happy, healthy, and generally enhance your life. So wave to everybody. Thanks for having me. Hey, Rachel. <laughs> so obviously, uh, everybody who's listening to this and who will listen to it afterwards, we've got a powerhouse crowd uh, with us here today. So I'm, I'm super excited about what we're going to learn here today. So, uh, you know, the, when I was, was trying to think of this, um, this particular topic, I, I mean, it's, it's something that women talk about all the time. You know, how do you get out of the go, 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 go all the time? And what I found um, myself when I was still in corporate was 
I fell prey to this idea that I could always do just one more thing. You know, it was as if I had this endless amount of energy. I remember one time in a job interview bragging about my huge capacity for production. Like I was bragging about, you know, you will get the work of two people if you hire me. I mean, holy cow, can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> bragging about that. Give me the job. You know, how crazy can you be? But I think, you know, women just think we can because we, uh, we do tend to juggle a lot of things and we do it really, really well. And somehow we think that's the way it has to be. I don't know if that was each of your experiences and that's sort of what led you to the work that you love and the things that you love to do, or, or if I'm just a weirdo out there with this experience all by myself. I don't think so. <laughs> so Rachel, tell us your story because I, you, you have kind of a unique story about what led you to make some massive changes in your life. Sure. Um, so Mine is not like a very conventional story of what got me into what I'm doing, but I was actually bedridden for a couple of years when I was young, um, in my teenage years and went through, you know, many different types of medicine, trying to figure out what was going on with myself. Long story short, many different types of practitioners, alternative pr practitioners started opening my mind and leading me on that path. And, um, so since then, I've done a lot of research. I've crafted my practice to basically most everything I treat in my practice, I'd say that I've probably had at some point. So I have a lot of experience in that uh, realm. But I'd say to answer your question as far as, you know, feeling like women can do everything, I think especially when you're an entrepreneur and you have an entrepreneur in mind, um, for me personally, like my number one strength is achiever. And so we get into this system of like achieve, 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 achieve for myself personally. And so I really had to take time to not only, you know, look back and reflect and say, Hey, like I have a health history and I'm not going to let that define it, but I also can't go at this speed if I want to stay with what I'm doing and the practice that I'm having. So the way I've even evolved in my practice is how it keeps me healthy <laughs> mm -hmm. or else I would completely burn out as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of learning as well your strengths and where to seek help for those weaknesses and to kind of set up, you know, I know some women in corporate can't, don't feel like they fully have the ability to fix some of those challenges or the authority to but you can do things in your life where you feel like you're in control and you can uh, create really good, healthy boundaries as far as creating that sustainability and making your business mm -hmm. work for you and to love what you're doing as well. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds a lot like what, what I've heard from each of you individually too. And, and there's a, there's got to be something that drives us to to ultimately make the decisions that we do, make the career choices that we do, you know, and so forth. And, you know, I um, it would be great if it wasn't as a result of some sort of a crash and burn. You know, it'd be great if you could learn it from somebody before, you know, hence this this fabulous panel, you know, that, that hopefully there's somebody out there that you guys can save before they hit that that crash and burn. Yeah, absolutely. That's the goal. Yeah, exactly. How about you, Anna? What's uh, what's your story? Well, um, as uh, you explained before, uh, you know, I have a nursing background. I am uh, originally from Spain. That's where I studied. If you have, haven't already noticed my accent, that's where I'm from. And uh, I um, I moved to New York City in my early twenties. So um, as much as I love the city, it was definitely a uh, roller coaster of uh, you know stress in a way and um, I had my personal training business there I own a studio and I was uh, training people and uh, helping them to be healthier but the reality is that I was going through my own health issues of overdoing 
and overachieving. And um, I feel a little related to what Rachel said before. I started studying and trying many different health practices to help me deal with um, that part of myself that I knew I had to, you know, take care of that I could train and I could eat healthy, but if I was not taking care of my stress level and I was doing some techniques to calm down the system, I was not going to be the healthiest that I could be. And I could now help my clients as well, you know, on their, on their goals. So yeah, it was, it was a very um, interesting experience through uh, all the years that I was there, Mm -hmm. which led me to actually uh, leave the city and, and find, you know, a more uh, sustainable or more country-like spaces that I know I thrive a little better. I moved out to the eastern of Long Island and then here to San Diego. And um, since then, i just been studying, learning as much as I can. Um, I got very involved with meditation in my late 20s mm-hmm. and how much that can actually help as well to have uh, more present, uh, more real life in a way. And... Um, like I said, many other things that I have tried throughout the years that I know that I have encouraged my clients to to try and do um, that could help them as well with their health goals. So um, it's been quite a, a road of learning and I'm still learning every day, right? Uh, everything everything we can always experience, new things, and we can always try new things that are going to help us be better at what we do. And uh, just one quick, one quick note about what you said. And I think it's very true that most of the time in our business, we do the things that we want to overcome, right? Like um, not just in health, right? But in many other professions, people that dedicate themselves to teaching others about money, they might have had some struggles with that and so on and so forth. So in a way, I think it's, it's a good thing because you're doing it also for yourself. And as you're learning through the process, you can help others along the way. So totally uh, relate with you on that. And um, one last thing I want to share, this is um, my superwoman. I thought it was very uh, relevant. It was a present uh, from a friend of mine on the holidays this year. Um, I get called Superwoman by my friends sometimes. So I guess that's, (laughs) I thought I'd share with that with you guys. (laughs) Claim it, wear it. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) So Linda, how about you? I bet there's a story behind Learn to Love to Exercise. Hey, Patty. Yeah, there sure is. So I actually shared it. I was at the uh, CWI luncheon today in Orange County, and we all did a little introduction because it was a smaller group today. And I, we were talking about our purpose and our passion. And the purpose and passion behind Learn to Love to Exercise is because almost 14 years ago, I lost my only brother to a heart attack. Mm. And he had just turned 45 years old. And although he was active in his job, he had a lot of stress Mm -hmm. and he didn't eat the healthiest. He didn't exercise consistently, even though he had physical activity in his job, but physical activity is of course different than structured exercise. Right. And, and he didn't get, you know, enough sleep and he did everything that the doctor told him to do because heart disease runs in, in our family. And he lived on medication and he monitored his blood pressure at home. He had an EKG four days prior to passing away. And it was actually his second heart attack and he didn't even know he had his first one. And I know he had a lot of stress uh, being he was, he was an entrepreneur as well. And it's just hard. And, and I know other entrepreneurs. I actually know a man that I used to uh, visit. He was one of my clients. And he passed away from a heart attack at work, and he was in a high-tech role, director role. And it's important, you know, that we do stop and kind of listen to our body and be our own advocate and not just take the doctor's advice, but we know our body the best. So really listen if there's something going on and not just keep pushing through. And like my doctor, my uh, brother, when he felt that something was wrong, what he did was he went home and to lie down and he was going to go back and work at this lady's house again, instead of going to the hospital. And I think a lot of times with men, especially they, you know, they're brought up to be a little macho. And so instead of like seeking help right away, they think, okay, I'm just going to power through it instead of like going and asking for help. So, so what happened to my brother really made me think more about, you know, what I was feeding my body. I took a lot of courses, became certified in nutrition. I was already exercising, Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. But myself, uh, 20 years ago when I was 32, I struggled a lot with losing weight. And I thought I had, you know, was doing everything right, but obviously I wasn't because then I wouldn't have trouble losing weight. <laughs> So now that I'm 52 years old, I know the right strategy. And for the years that I struggled, now I, I know what is right. And I know how to teach others to do what is customized for their body so that they can live a healthier life and, and eliminate medications or especially reduce them. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's good. So it's so important that we just listen to our own bodies yeah. and, and, and ask for mm -hmm. help. So Eva, what's the answer to that question? About uh, of asking for help? No, about caffeine in and then wine in. Oh. And just go. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Sounds well, like a disaster. <laughs> it is a disaster. And can you imagine having the panic of waking up feeling worse than when you went to sleep? And that's part of my history, uh, you know, after trying all the things that everybody here has has mentioned going to the doctor after doctor and eventually firing one doctor after another i finally heard the answer um clearly when i was asking how come this is happening to me and that this was a chronic fatigue right anxiety insomnia even infertility early menopause um even a cancer scare so these things, when I asked, how come this is happening to each one of those doctors in passing, they said, we don't know. So I finally heard that and I went, I'm barking up the wrong tree and I need to look up what other solutions are available that allows me to give my body what it needs. I just had that belief, give your body what it needs, it will heal itself. Mm -hmm. Exercise was making me worse because my body was so foundationally poor that it couldn't even support walking. I mean, it was it was dire. <laughs> so it, it's like, I would love to say that the, the things that are out there, uh, alternative medicine, if you've ever Googled alternative medicine, you will get back a report of a ridiculous amount of results. Try this, try that. And it becomes very difficult to navigate. So the answer is, is really, what does the body need? If you're, if you need to give it what it, what it, what it's required to heal, then the next question is, well, how do I know what that is? Mm -hmm. And for me, the answer that allowed my body to receive those nutrients came from my hair. So it was the, the process of displacement and creating a whole new foundation for my body, getting rid of the toxins automatically and safely rebalancing the minerals that had been imbalanced and caused uh, even uh, hormonal imbalances. So getting those aligned, they allowed for a greater immune system and therefore greater natural energy that didn't come from coffee and a relaxation at the end of the day triggered by my own natural hormonal senses, you know, and, and living on the planet, you know, paying attention to the sun going down, that kind of stuff that set my body into a natural sleep. So the answer is not clear cut. It's, it sounds like it could be a simple story, but the, the question is always, what does my body need? Right, right. Yeah, you know, um, I, I spent so many years in corporate America as well as um, then running my own business for a period of time. So I've, I've been in both worlds and I think the pressures are, different and incredibly similar as well you know so um, I'll, I'll tell you a story my my husband worked for a technology company in San Diego and they had uh, the culture was was pretty bad I mean they really demanded uh, 110 percent was nothing I mean they it was 130 140 you know percent and he was working such incredible over time, you know, trying to keep up with things and they kept downsizing around him until it was like, you know, I said, what do you, you're now, you're it, you know, you're the only person and, and you're, you're starting to do the work of all these different people because the work has to get done and there's customers to support and yada, yada. And there was a bench outside in the front of the building. This is the, the truth. 
a bench that was dedicated to an employee who died at his desk. And it was like, <laughs> I, I wonder how that person's family felt like, oh, we're going to, you know, put this monument to your loved one who worked themselves to death, you know, here for this company. And, and it's like, after, after all is said and done, absolutely for what, you know? And, and I know that when I was in corporate every year, one of my New Year's Eve um, resolutions was not to work as much. And then when I was an entrepreneur, it was like, you know, that joke about you get to decide, you know, which 12 hours of the day you want to work, you know, so it just, it seems like unless you begin to prioritize on taking care of yourself so you can take care of the business, then you're just headed for, you know, a, a crash and burn. I mean, I don't know how, how else to, to say it, but that's what it seems, you know, to me. And that's what I seem to hear from, from all of you and what led to some of the work that you do and, you know, what, what we hear just from people in general, you know. Is it this way in other countries? I would have to say yes. I have clients in other countries and they complain of the same um, maladies. They, they, have, they have the same, I'm, I'm so tired and I'm so frustrated and I've gone from doctor to doctor and I'm not getting the help that I need. And I want to say it's, it's the developed countries, you know, that we, we've adopted this way of life. And we thought, we thought Japan was crazy for working 50 hours a week, you know, 30 years ago. And now look at us. Yeah. So it, we've, we've adopted this unhealthy, imbalanced way of thinking that work is our primary source of happiness somehow. And um, it's burning us out, like you said. It burned me out. Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. I think it all depends, Patty. So I grew up in Norway, and there is a uh, better life-work balance there. Uh, at, at some point, you know, the bigger cities, it's, uh, they work a little bit more, but... They do have a shorter work week. They do have a lot more vacation than they do in the U.S. So it depends. I mean, I've, I've traveled quite a bit in Europe and stuff, and, and I have clients in different countries as well. So it just, it just kind of depends. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of countries that have four or five, six weeks vacation a year. So just with that, you get some more time off. But it's not to say that they're not stressed, and it's not to say that, you know, they don't live on medications or and are unhealthy because you know they eat the wrong things and they don't exercise enough and mm -hmm. maybe the doctors don't know what's what's going on so mm -hmm. there's a mix yeah yeah how about spain anna yeah i was just gonna say i, I do have to agree with that spain is very similar where you get a month of vacation and it um, doesn't seem like people's life revolves around work like here um, I believe there's a higher sense of community every time that I go there is different. I just feel it, you know, in towns and, and in other places, the, the support and, you know, just walking around. So I think that um, helps with uh, people's stress uh, levels to just feel that they are part of a community and, you know, feel that they are um, more involved in that than just, you know, um, having work as, as the one thing that you do and that's your value, right? Mm -hmm. So I do feel that difference when I go there. I still agree uh, with Linda that, yes, there's a lot of uh, medications that I still taking, and there's a lot of relying on doctors, which I totally agree with. I think what, what Eva said before, that we have to listen to our body because I, I think we are our best doctors in a way. Not that we are not going to need external help, but we need to listen to our body and see what is going on in order to, to get the necessary help that is needed in each time and, and, and for each person might be different. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I have felt that different and it's interesting because I was just there recently and every time I go lately, um, it's, it's, I see it more and more. Um, and I do also have clients all around the, the world, like Linda, uh, even in Australia. And it's just different sometimes how, how people are, are living their lives um, when I'm approaching them through coaching sessions and I'm you know, talking to them about their lifestyle and how to make those changes. Um, I think we have some things that we share for sure. And I think every culture might be a little bit different. Um, I was just thinking before what you were um, saying in regards to some of the other things that we'll, you know, that we have experienced or that we have a struggle. 
And, you know, um, I think one of the things that society, talking about coffee and, and alcohol, right, and wine, uh, I think it's so accepted to just, um, you know, that, that binge drinking or, or even the coffee binge drinking that I believe is so unhealthy, you know, and it's just socially accepted. We just take it as something that is normal and, you know, happy hours and whatnot. And I just really think that it's a big factor, specifically for women as we age. Uh, we cannot process alcohol as well. And the effects that that takes into our body are, are pretty, pretty dramatic. So, you know, I, I have to encounter myself a few years ago with that situation of like, well, do I really want to do this or is this healthy for me? And obviously it was not. And I had to um, look at that and, and definitely um, uh, slow it down and reduce it. Mm -hmm. And I work with people in that way as well, because I believe it's a very, very um, important aspect of health as well. Um, so anyway, just wanted to share that because I feel like it's, it's something important to think about sometimes um, when we are struggling with some health issues that we don't really know where they are coming from and society feels like, you know, this is normal. Well, I really don't think it's as normal for our bodies and that's my, my belief and my experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, um, that's a whole different kind of, of pressure, right? That comes, you know. Yeah the the social norms that have been built up around us you know this is the way you relax mm -hmm. and when you go out with people this is what's this is what we're going to do and um and that can bring its own kinds of uh i, I guess social pressure is just the right way to put mm -hmm. it this is what everybody does this is what's normal you know and and it yeah. may not be a normal thing for you or it may not be good for you or just because you're there does it have to be like that you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. common doesn't really mean just because something's common doesn't mean it's good so yeah. you have to differentiate that mm -hmm. too yeah. yeah yeah do you think this is at all generational are are some of the younger generations beginning to question this concept of work-life balance Um, I can answer that probably because I'm the youngest one. <laughs> um, but what do you I, say? I'm only 35. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would just say, um, you know, kind of my peers and who I see that come into my practice and, and people that are colleagues around myself that are kind of around my age group. I say I see way more and more individuals becoming more entrepreneurs. Um, and so I don't know if that's necessarily the mindset of, um, you know, taking care of themselves more. So, you know, I can't really speak to that part, but I do see more and more people starting to think out of the box in that way and start to be more entrepreneurs because they, they mm -hmm. think about like, you know, more residual incomes and they think about, okay, well, how can I spend more time with my family? And. So I think in a way they're starting to think differently um, versus, you know, I just want to be a doctor because it makes a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that is definitely switching. I'm seeing, you know, changes in minds and attitudes that way. But I still think there's a huge gap in people actually be in, being in tune with themselves. And that's really just around all the spectrum of ages, really being in tune with how they feel. And no matter what they're doing, no matter where you're at, no matter what job you have, it's really about stepping into yourself and really knowing yourself so well that you know how to manage these things. Mm -hmm. So I think they're starting to shift that way, but we still have a lot of work to do as far as people, um, you know, really and truly being in tune with how they feel and feeling empowered to know what to do when they know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you answered that because I don't work that much with your um, women over 40s, usually my age. So I, I was curious to that answer. I thought it was a, a great question. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's funny because I, um, I, I do corporate teaching um, for American Management Association. And they're, uh, they're called open um, enrollment classes. So, 
it's it's one of the best things I've ever done as far as getting to understand people better because in these classes there will be uh, people of all generations, um, people from all kinds of industry and business. Um, they're all there to learn. Uh, primarily, I teach communication type classes and. It's really interesting whenever we start talking about generations and start, you know, um, introducing this idea of uh, how one generation versus another communicates or how they view diversity or, you know, any, any of the topics we might be talking about. And it's, um, I'm just really grateful for that opportunity because it does give me so much exposure to different people and different walks of life and so forth. But I do find, um, you know, as, as the mom of, uh, of both millennials and Gen Xers, that they look at life a lot differently, a lot more different than I did, you know, growing up and, you know, feeling like you have to achieve and you, you know, you, you don't play until you've worked so many, you know, hours and, you know, it, and play is only for Saturday and Sunday anyway, you know, that's, you know, the, the week is all for working and stuff. So I, I think that, you know, my hope is that some of the younger generations coming up are, are challenging what they've seen the rest of us on the hamster wheel you know, introduce and some of the things that come about, you know, because of it. Um, I don't know if, if you guys see some of the same things, you know, Linda and Eva, I don't know if you guys also have exposure to younger generations or um, what you're seeing in that area. Uh, yeah, I have some, oh, go ahead, Eva. Go ahead. <laughs> We're all, we do that a lot. Um, I, can, I can say that when I'm at an event where maybe I have a table at a health fair and a, a corporate event and the younger folks, like you, let's call them millennials, right? So they'll, they'll come through and they'll, they'll see what I have to offer. And we're talking about chronic fatigue and energy. They haven't all, they, they're still going full speed. They've got their, their pedal to the metal, the foot's down to the floor and they don't, they don't see the need to, to fortify the body and make sure that it's toxin free. They're just, this is what I'm seeing with them is they're, they're like, nope, I don't, I don't need health stuff. I'm good. Yep. Uh, however, I do get the occasional um, person but between the ages of five and, and, and let's say 28. And I know a five year old's not a millennial, but I, I do get those people because the, the imbalances from our, our generation Xers, which are typically, typically the parents of these millennials, um, cause I have two millennials and I'm a Gen Xer. Mm -hmm. So typically imbalances are passed from mother to child in the womb. Yes. So I'm not surprised to see people trying to overcome health imbalances younger and younger, but, um, so far the awareness to the people I've been exposed to not as high. Mm. Um. So I have some, uh, younger clients and the reason some of them come and work with me is actually because they see their parents who are my age and maybe 10 years older and they're deteriorating mm -hmm. and they don't want to be in the same situation as their parents. They don't want to be obese or severely overweight. They don't want to live on medications. They want to, they don't want to walk, you know, with a cane. Mm -hmm. So they're like, okay, I want to be, when I get to 50, I want to be fit at 50. So then they come to me when they're maybe in their, you know, twenties or early thirties. Well, that's good. That's very yeah. forward thinking, you know, of them. Uh, exactly. I, yeah. There's a big gap. Like my, my parents, uh, you know, they're, they're both gone now, but um, at, at the age that I am, you know, right now, cause I'm, I'm 66 um, and Am I 66? I always, I lose track and I have to count back from my, <laughs> I'm 66, yes. And, but I think of my mom at this age and she just seemed a lot older than me, you know, and, um, and I've got little grands now, you know, I've got a seven-year-old and I've got uh, three-year-old twins and I, I mean, they keep me going and you're up and down off and on the ground and up and you know in a tree and and you're on the playground and you're chasing them and and I and that's what I want I don't want to be 
out of breath because I'm watching them. I don't want to be telling them, no, Nani can't come play and do that, you know. So I kind of have selfish reasons for wanting to, you know, not not be sort of like my mom was, you know, at, at the same age. But looking at, you know, 10 years from now, you know, I, I still want things to be pretty much like they are now, if not, if not better, you know. Yeah. Well, my mom is actually uh, 86 years old. She, she won't let me tell social media, so, so keep it a secret. Yeah. Okay, it's a secret. Uh, but I got her started in the gym when she was 57, and I always tell people it's never too late. You're never too old to get started. Because I got her started in the gym when she was seven, 57, and even though she was petite and she ate fairly healthy, she wasn't strong, mm -hmm. and now she's super strong. And she goes to the gym five days a week. She dances every Wednesday night for two hours nonstop. And she's 86 years old. Wow. And people look at her and they're like, oh, my God. I mean, her doctors even, they have to, like, look at her driver's license a few times and, you know, ask her if, you know, this is really her. Yeah. So, <laughs> That's it's, fabulous. It's, yeah, it is fabulous. Yeah. 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 Well, what are some tips that you guys might – might give some, you know, I, I imagine that all of you have clients coming to you that are like, man, I'm just, I'm just at the end. I have no energy. I'm, you know, chronic fatigue. Um, you know, what have you, I know, Rachel, you do like a full body makeup on, on folks, you know, to, to find out what all is going on. What are some of the, what are the things that people bring to you? And then what is it that you share with them? You know, is there, like steps one through three, maybe, or where they should start? Well, that's not so much of an easy answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> because every person is different. And, um, you know, like we were talking even about generational stuff, you can bring generational stuff along the line with you. But I think the most important thing in why we're doing this is to educate people beforehand before things start failing and I think that's when most people come to us unfortunately um, so if we can do a better job of educating before that then we're actually you know doing our job but most you know people come to me from all over and they come to me with many different things um, like Ava mentioned chronic fatigue headaches you know body pains insomnia mood disorders whatever it is going on um, because my main focus is enhancing the brain's ability to function and really your body to heal itself. That's our whole process is, you know, figuring out, it's kind of like a detective of what is your brain doing? Why is it doing that? Let's just not give medications or let's just not always give supplements. Like let's just figure out what's going on and to enhance your body's natural process. So um, as far as steps, uh, as far as when patients come into my practice, my first and foremost step is to get their nervous system calmed down. Um, typically when people come in that are very busy or you know, in corporate or just a mom with a job and so many kids, is their nervous system is on overdrive. And so telling them to do things like go meditate or you know, do this for yourself is not always possible because their nervous system is completely wired mm -hmm. uh they've been living off coffee they've been living off wine like we talked about so my goal first and foremost is to always reset that and start to uh redirect where their nervous system is kind of rewired and then they're more in a better space to be like okay now i can really understand what you're talking about now i'm ready to actually change my diet and talk about my stress and you know get specific things that I need to do and they're more on board that way so that's generally even if someone comes in to me with you know nutritional stuff which I do as well I always start with the nervous system because we have to get that brain working better and we have to get that firing better um, and really for them to understand their own body and it's not always, you know, I don't want them always coming back to me for everything, but it's like, hey, this is actually what's going on. I spend a lot of time educating my patients um, so that they can feel more empowered about how, you know, what can they do at home to better assess. I don't want them in here every week. <laughs> I love them, but I don't want them in here every week. <laughs> so you really do. I, I think a big part of what I do is educate, but that looks differently for every person. 
mm -hmm. it's not an easy, easy answer. And Anna, I would think that's, that's, um, resonates with you as well, you know, being a mentor and a, and a coach. Um, so someone comes to you and they've got this, man, I'm out of, I'm out of whack. I can't sleep. I can't turn it off at night. You know, what, what are some of the things you start looking at? Yeah, it's, it's interesting and kind of what Rachel said, right, it's very hard because everybody's going to be different. And I always like to have a, an initial conversation with people um, to see where they are at. Most people actually come to me uh, for exercise because that's what I'm most well known. Um, but uh, one thing that I do is a general assessment of where, where they are because as somebody mentioned before, sometimes they aren't ready to exercise as much as they think they do, right, if the body is not... Um, properly here to that yet. So we talk about that. We talk about what are the other things that are going on in their lives in regards to, you know, lack of sleep, um, you know, stress levels, uh, how nutritionally they are being taken care of themselves as well. And uh, I work with people on those three levels. So exercise is definitely my uh, longest expertise, but I started nutrition more or less at the same time. And then uh, coaching, is something that I believe that working with those three things at the same time is when you can actually help people the best mm -hmm. uh, and not just like exercise like I was doing in the past. And um, just a, a tool that I think, or a tip that works well for most people uh, is to think that, you know, quick fix usually never work. So, you know, trying to schedule yourself four or five workouts a week um, it's probably actually counterproductive to train that much. You probably want to start a little bit slower at the beginning. You don't want to do, from my perspective, a very um, intense diet either because uh, you are going to come back to your old habits. So the work that I, I like to work with people and the way that I see in my experience works is when you make a small changes over time. Yeah. So helping them to know what is the first step and uh, make that change in their life. And, and, and if there is a habit, that they need to switch, create another habit to replace that one that is the healthy one. Mm -hmm. So little by little making those changes as opposed to a quick uh, fix that usually, like I said, never work and everybody comes back to their old, to their old pattern. Um, and one last thing that I would say and that I know works well for me and it works for people that work on a schedule is to actually schedule the self-care for yourself, you know, put it on your calendar. So not just the work that you're going to do, but also when am I going to work out? When am I going to even cook? Um, and not to be very, you know, obsessive compulsive about it, but at least save yourself those times, you know, the day that you know that you are, it is time for me and I'm going to be taking care of myself and everything else can, can wait. Um, so that's uh, overall, I think what I can, what I can uh, talk general. Yeah. You know what, what you said that was really brilliant was, um, you know, it, it, making it realistic you know, because um, it's just like when we're setting goals for somebody in their business, you know, and, and we talk about making exactly. realistic goals, to, um, you know, not setting people up to fail. And yet we think, uh, oh, I've got to get in shape. So tomorrow, I am going to run a 5k, you know, and no, you're not, or you might do that, but then you're going to pay for it, you know, the rest of the week, and you're never going to do it again, you're going to hate it for the rest of your life. So, you know, setting up some like realistic goals that will make you want to continue to do this, you know, just like, just like we yeah. do, you know, with anything else. Yeah, no, it's funny you say that because I always say um, that we do have a financial plan. We have a business plan, but how many of us have a health plan? Yeah. So it's not like you're not going to have that plan and those outcomes that you want to have. But like you said, it's going to be a realistic goal setting in order to achieve that outcome. So. Yeah, I think that is very important. Yeah, yeah. Eva, what yes. do you got to say? <laughs> well, there's so much that's been said. I'm like, yes, exactly. I agree with that. Absolutely. So, mm -hmm. you know, when it, when it comes to, as even back to that original conversation about sometimes the body is so stressed, they can't meditate. I hear it all the time. Mm -hmm. I say, hey, give it five minutes. And they say, hey, I can't do five minutes. I can't concentrate. And the joke is, well, if you can't do five minutes of meditation, then do 10. But <laughs> it becomes, <laughs> it's a possibility for people. And I can see it on the hair test because it's about, you know, the, the stress levels we can see 
where a person is stuck in that state of high stress. I call it sympathetic dominance. And there's an actual couple of levels in the relationship between these two you know, different minerals that tells me this before it even comes out of their mouth. And it's interesting to see the correlation leaving that minerally over time and allowing for, I call it the freeways of the mind and the emotions to open up. And it allows for the processing and the space to move. It reminds me of those silly games that are made up of squares and you've got to move one square in order to make the other, the pictures come together, you know? Yeah. And uh, if it gets jammed up because it's just, it, you can't, that's the stress. So we alleviate the stress manually and then all of these emotional factors are then able to be processed. It, it's, a, it's a backwards movement. So some of us are moving from the mind down to the body and others of us are moving from the body up into the mind and spirit. And it's, it's, it all, it all works. It's just what doorway do you want to start in? <laughs> like what matches? And that's, that's the advice I would give is find somebody who's a, a, a coach that a health coach who has been where you are, are where you want to be and has what you want. And, and then start there. That would be my advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my advice is prioritize yourself and do it earlier in the day versus waiting till later on when you may be too tired, too many excuses come up, different things pop up. Mm -hmm. And so prior, so like it's been said, put it on the schedule, but really prioritize yourself and learn to say no, maybe no, not now to others so that you can put yourself first. Sort of like they do on the airplane, you know, put the mask on yourself first before you put it on others. <laughs> mm -hmm. So really taking care of yourself and, and prioritizing that is so important because if we prioritize ourselves first thing in the morning, then we're going to have more energy and be more productive throughout the day and we're going to be better able to help the others that we want to help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think that it's important um, like Eva said, I can't meditate for five minutes. Well, then you need to meditate for 10, you know, is that um, we're really good at putting barriers in front of what we know that we ought to do. And um, there was a, a period of time when, um, when I said, well, I can't, I just can't make time for exercising. And then it was like, well, I'll, I'll exercise in the morning, but I really, I don't want to have to change my clothes and I don't want to this. And I, and I just had like this list of, of excuses, you know, for not doing it. And, you know, had gotten to a place where, where I was so fused up almost, you know, it was like, I don't know how to explain it other than it was like, my joints just didn't work. Walking was difficult and moving your arms was difficult and stuff. And I was way too young, you know, for that kind of thing. So I literally sat down with myself and said, what are all the things that keep me from exercising? And after you got through all of the, you know, I, I don't have time and I got too much to blah, blah, blah. It was like, well, I don't want to go to a gym. Fine. There's tons of online things that you can do that keep you from not going to the gym. Okay. Well, that excuse is gone. And then I don't want to change my clothes and put on weight workout clothes. So it's like, okay, fine. Do it in your pajamas. And so literally here is my deal is it is the first thing I do in the morning. I do it online and I have like a, a library of about 50 things to choose from. And some days it's, it's aerobic and the next day it's strength training and the next day it's um, motion, you know, and mobility and so forth. But it's the first thing and I'm in my pajamas and then my pajamas go in the dirty clothes and I get cleaned up and I get dressed and there goes my day. So I just like got serious with myself and took all my excuses out of you know just took them all out of the of the the realm so now the only person i have to fight with is myself you know for when i just <laughs> don't want to <laughs> well good for you i i totally want to congratulate you because i think you went through all the layers like you were saying of like figuring out why am i not doing it because there's not just the reason of you know i don't want to exercise they're usually something a little deeper and you figure out how to do it for yourself. So yeah. that's a great example of, I think how, you know, everybody should think about it. What works for you is gonna be very different than what works for me, right? And it's fine in that way, yeah. so, yeah. Well, you know, I, um, my mom did not uh, exercise. She, you know, she walked a lot because she didn't drive. So she walked a lot. 
but she didn't exercise. It was not, physical fitness was not a part of my growing up. I wasn't encouraged to take on sports. I wasn't, um, it just was not a thing. You know, I, I don't think I played any kind of organized sports after I was, you know, a, in elementary school. You know, it just wasn't the thing to do. I wasn't encouraged in that area. It wasn't modeled for me either. And so when when my daughter started, you know, entering you know, I would say like third, fourth grade, whatever, I started encouraging her if the boys were signing up for basketball or, or little league or whatever the heck it was, you know, it was like, hey, you know, you need to find something you want to do. And she really dug volleyball. And, and so she did really well in volleyball. But I wanted her to not think about weight. And I didn't want her to think about um, body image and so forth. I wanted her to think about health and, and all the things that I had not you know, had, like I said, modeled for me. Lots of talk about weight and the way you look and stuff, but not so much about how you feel and why you should move and, and stay active. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's hard, like we talked about in younger generations to really think about at their age. I mean, for me, my youth was kind of taken away from me because unfortunately I was really ill so to me now being able to exercise and do the things that I do is a total blessing. So I don't look as it, at it as a chore. Um, you know, there's definitely mornings where I don't want to get up for sure. But um, I think for different generations, it's, it's thought in a different way. And so they don't necessarily think of it in that way. And so it's, it is, our bodies are meant to move in a healthy way. It's not through pain, not through limitations, but we're meant to move but it's also about finding what brings you the most joy in that movement. Mm -hmm. And again, looking at it as your health, like this is an investment in you. You're your biggest investment in your life. So if you don't invest in it, then it's usually like chasing symptoms and things many years down the line. Yeah. And so I, I was taught at an early age, but not everybody is taught that. Mm -hmm. And so we're, you know, looking at different ages and trying to navigate how to fit that in. Any final thoughts, ladies, about what, what do we say to, um, to this generation of, of overworked, overburdened, stressed out people? What do we say to them? And how do we not reproduce these these negative cycles in the future? So in in our final moments here, just give your uh, your stump speech. <laughs> I say, put your excuses on the shelf and prioritize yourself. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Right on. <laughs> That's a good one. That is a good one. Yeah, I say, uh, health is wealth is your biggest asset. Asset. So let's not let's not forget that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. I mean, health health really is wealth. If you if you're healthy, you can you can manage through anything else. But you know, just the idea of somebody having all the money in the world and laying on their deathbed, you know, way way too young is is the saddest thing I can think of. Yeah. Yeah. This is Eva, and I I just want to say, you know, I I um lost my ex-husband at the age of 45 because he did nothing but listen to doctors and didn't take charge of his own health care. Mm -hmm. He had a heart, not that heart attack. It was unnecessary. He was on 17 medications. And how much, I ask the question, it's like, how much money would you like to spend trying to overcome all of the dysfunction, all of the pain, all of the, the worries and woes that life brings you? You could forefront it. But I find that most people wait until they're on their last leg yeah. and I my mission my mission is to educate ahead of time I wanted to do that with him it didn't work out I had two weeks it wasn't enough time but do, do something before it's too late and before it's so late that it costs you so much money that you can't enjoy your retirement mm -hmm. so do it now not later yeah. yeah 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 I was trying to remember that quote it it's escaping my mind but it's the quote about like you spend your whole life chasing um money foregoing your health and then you spend the half the other half of your life chasing health <laughs> and spending all the money that you earn <laughs> yeah. you know what i mean yeah <laughs> so 
I, I don't remember exactly what that quote is, but it speaks to that too. I mean, you have to, you have to take charge of your health. It's like we said, your most important asset and don't wait just for things to fall through. If you want to go at a high level, you have to give your body what it needs. So make yourself a priority. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. So if we want our businesses to thrive, if we want our families to thrive, we want ourselves to thrive, we really have to put ourselves first, prioritize our health and, and take care of, of ourselves so that we can take care of business. I, I like that saying that um, no one ever puts on their tombstone, gee, I wish I'd worked more. You know, <laughs> I, I don't think so. I don't think that's the way it's going to go. Well, you guys, this has been a really great, um, enjoyable evening. I'm so glad that you spent this time with me and shared your um, considerable wisdom, you know, with, with all of our, our listeners and those that will be listening to these in the, the replay as well. So um, thanks again for your time. Thank you so much for sharing with us. And, and oh, Eva, good to see your little face there. Uh, but uh I just want to say to everybody, you know, stay, stay tuned, watch the Facebook page, look for these shows that come up. You know, we do in the ladies room, you know, about once a month, um, topics are a little bit more, um, you know, like kind of down into our hearts and things that, you know, we want to talk about and stuff. And then there's always the ask me any things that are, are every few weeks as well. So all of these are brought to you by connected women of influence. And I look forward to the next time I see all of you. Uh, in person, if not uh, online. So take care, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Bye.